Hi, I'm Nicole Dyer from ABC Gold Coast and the proud ambassador of Gold Coast Open House. We hope you enjoy this recording from our 2022 Open House Talks program. Welcome to Gold Coast Open House 2022, everyone. My name is Rosie Kennedy. I'm the chair of Gold Coast Open House this year, much to my surprise and amazement. The aim of um, Gold Coast Open House is to engage the general public in dialogue with architects through the promotion of contemporary and historical architecture and design in our city. Our goal is to communicate the process of placemaking and highlight the range of professionals involved in the creation of amazing spaces, places and buildings within our incredible city of the Gold Coast. We're a not-for-profit organisation and rely solely on volunteers and sponsors. So please support Gold Coast Open House by volunteering, uh, sharing your experience on social media with friends, buying, <coughs> buying one of our gorgeous tote bags designed by none other than Claudio Kerak just really a, a collector's item, and they're here. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners. In the spirit of reconciliation, Gold Coast Open House acknowledges the traditional custodian of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. For this Q&A, um, Gold Coast Open House is pleased to work in partnership with Degenhart Shed Architecture and Urban Design and Dune Street Landscape Architecture to bring you this presentation of Coastside. I'd like to um, ask Amy and Joel to come and join us here Amy here, and, and Joel. Now, um, I hope that little distraction at the end didn't um, make you forget all the questions that you're going to have for jo uh, Amy and Joel. Um, so they're here ready for you to ask all kinds of questions about um, architecture and uh, the design of this house in particular. Um, but I think I'm just going to take, oh, actually, we better introduce you properly first. Amy Degenhardt, Degenhardt Shed, and um, Joel Lewis, Dune Street Landscape. Would you like to say a little bit more about yourself, Amy? No, didn't have anything. It's no. just a slide. slide I didn't have anything prepared <laughs> as such. But, um, well, I'm an architect that has been working on the Gold Coast uh, since um, sometime last century, uh, 1986, I believe. I um, migrated from Chicago. Um, I was told when I went this way that everyone on the Gold Coast would get their right arm as architects to be going the other way, but I was gonna have myself a working holiday, visit some family and carry on to the UK. So um, that holiday got a little bit extended and here I am still today. And um, it's a wonderful place and I just see so much change and potential and um, I just love the fact that I feel like it's got, you know, just this ability to um, um, embrace innovation. Thanks, Amy. Joel, how long have you been um, a landscape architect? Uh, for about 16, 17 years, I think. Um, and been on the coast for 13 years. So originally from New Zealand um, and yeah, had a a wide variety of experience from working for a, de a developer um, to yeah, obviously landscape architecture companies and also uh, in town planning and, and council um, before I yeah jumped ship and, and started my own business uh, a couple of years ago now so yeah so um, so you two uh, um I suppose you call it an, uh, an immigrant. I'm, I'm a, an early arrival. I mean, a late arrival. I've seen the light as well and um, moved to this fantastic part of the world. Like Amy says, it's just so full of energy and um, um, full of potential. 
So I'm going to start the questioning. I'm just going to take the, the privilege of that. And the first question I'm going to ask is, so Amy, how many levels are there actually in this house? Oh, oh they're tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually just three levels. Um, and I, I do have a tendency in my design sometimes, they're a bit like puzzle boxes occasionally. You know, people can kind of get lost and people might think, oh, that's a bad thing. But really what it is, it's, it's a way of sort of making um, kind of less seem more because there's a certain sort of discovery process about it. So the, the ground floor, you kind of forget about it. And then there's the, the, there's, you know, the first level and the second level, which is basically where the bulk of the house is. OK. And there also appears to be a roof level. Oh, OK. That is, that is true. But if, if, if it were a town planning answer, <laughs> the, the roof terrace is there, and of course, it, it can't have any cover. Um, and yes, it's, it, it is on top of the, um, say, the, the core sort of wet areas, so to speak, on the, on that top living level, so that they can be compressed down, and then that roof terrace fits within that sort of cozy environment, as described in the video. So yeah, I guess I guess you'd say that's four. Yeah, okay. See, I knew it was a tough question. No, not so not so tough. I think um, people are kind of interested in what these um, town planning things are that are a, a constraint, but also um, can actually, if um, used properly, can actually um, achieve something more exciting. So um, can you explain um, what you meant when the client said did not want to um, have to seek any relaxations? Um, sure. So when um, when you set about uh, designing for a single residential, um, a single dwelling lot, you, you if you're not asking for any favours, so to speak, in terms of setback relaxations or um, car, car parking, usually is, is a no-brainer for houses. But setbacks can some, sometimes come into play, or if you're wanting a granny flat or something special, you've got to go and ask council for uh, material change of use or development approval to do something special. In Logan, for instance, you actually have to have an MCU for setback relaxation. MCU um, is a what? A material change of use. Mm -hmm. So that's a planning application. On the Gold Coast, I think you just the certifier might just need to go through that process. It's not quite as onerous. Um, so, in, but in doing that, it takes more time and a little bit more money. Now, it's very interesting in this case. Nobody knew. Well, actually, my yeah, 2020. I think the whole thing got started and demolished and the button was pushed just before COVID. So um, the timing was you know, amazingly critical, but nobody knew it at the time. But if it had been delayed a week or two by um, some kind of you know, application that needed to seek a relaxation, the whole thing may not be there right now. That's interesting. Um, look, any time you want to ask a question, please put your hand up high and I'll come over with a um, with the mic. There's a question there up, up high. You sure it's a question? Everyone, check that it's a question. Um, you know, check in your head first. Uh, my question's for Joel, because in the film we heard Amy talking about the building. So Joel, I'd like to hear more about the um, brief and the concept for the landscaping. Well, because it was a narrow lot, um, I broke it down into three areas. Obviously, the frontage setback, the side boundary, and the rear setback. Um, so essentially, the rear was, as soon as I walked out the back, um, the scaffold was still up, um, yeah, full, full construction mode. But I had to identify, uh, I suppose, what, what areas needed to be designed. And first of all, I, I noted that one of the neighbours was a two-storey house right on the right on the back um, back fence so and then potential for the, the property uh, one of the properties adjacent to be knocked down and and uh, and a new uh, new building on that one as well so identified screening as a as a, as a major um, a major design factor out the back to provide privacy for their rear pool area um, side boundary was again was 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 screening uh, and and privacy and then the front was uh, essentially trying to soften the built form and I suppose that the, there were sort of three factors that came into the design phase was the client wanted to be able to um, provide a, th a third car park. So if they can have two, two cars in the, uh, in the driveway, they wanted, to, they wanted their uh, daughter to be able to um, 
uh, park on the property as well. And given the area, there was, it wasn't actually any, well, the parking is very, very uh, limited. So I was able to sort of design a, it was, I suppose it was about a five or 600 mil path slash um, wheel uh, entry onto the property um, to enable, to be able to get a, um, yeah, a, I suppose a discrete third car park when needed uh, without it actually triggering any other um, application. Um, also the, the meter board was another challenge because that was supposed to be on the side of the house. Uh, and then late in the design process, uh, I was told that no, it has to stay on the, essentially on the front boundary. So um, again, that was uh, something that we had to design around and um, make it look like it was supposed to be there. And um, yeah, use, we used some battening and some, some landscaping and a climber um, and integrated the letterbox um, to yeah, be able to sort of hide and, and soften that. So um, yeah, that was, I suppose, the, the basic brief. Oh, and the theme was obviously coastal, uh, but because of the area and also um, the planting around the pool, um, I sort of made it more of a tropical coastal to ensure that uh, we had no leaf drop around the pool area causing maintenance. So it was, yeah, that balance of, of, of coastal and, and tropical. Um, Joel and Amy, just so that people can get a, an idea of um, what we're dealing with in terms of dimensions and, and thinking about the landscape. So literally, um, how wide is the narrow lot and what kind of setbacks are you are we talking about on the sides? And I'll ask you a little bit more about those neighbours soon too. Oh, that is such a good question. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I hope I've got that in my memory banks. I believe, and you might correct me if I get it wrong, but I think it's basically a 10 by 40. I think that's right. So it's about 400 square metres. So long and narrow. So long and narrow. Now in the, um, um, the um, uh, uh, um, Queensland um, Development Code, manuals you've got the setback relax uh, setback sort of specified so um, you drop back to that which is Queensland wide when you're not asking for any favors and um, those give you a dispensation for um, narrow net lots so I think the ground floor setback was 750 then I think it goes up to 1.2 on the first floor on the second it may be 1.5 I think 1.5, and so it's a bit of a wedding cake uh, shape. And, and that is something that um, Andrew was always um, pleased and, you know, that we made the, the way that we put together the built form didn't express that wedding cake look. And in the video, when I say we tucked the kitchen in under that last little bit, so you, there's vertical um, cutoffs for those heights. So on that um, top level, that living level, we were able to fit the kitchen into the first floor setback instead of the second floor setback. So that's how we got that extra width there. So that's the kind of setback we're dealing with there. In the front, because it's a small lot, so the narrowness makes one setback, the um, size makes another. And we were able to bring that um, front setback down to maybe four meters, whereas if with larger lots, it would normally be six. The rear setback wasn't so critical because um, Andrew had briefed um, Joel to do that backyard. It's very important to him to have that backyard and that little swimming pool. So that was already a given that we were going to have a backyard. So that never was really a discussion point of the rear setback. But, uh, so does so that answer the question? Well, kind of. I'm just sort of thinking at um, ground level, a setback of 750 millimetres is not a a lot in terms of um, space for planting, space for moving past the house, etc. I'll let you take some of that in relation to landscape, but just to um, reiterate, so when I said if we didn't see the wedding cake shape, that's obviously because we didn't take advantage of that 750 for practical reasons to keep that passageway. So we were able to keep that rectilinear look and still kind of, um, you know, be advantaged, but not totally. And also I might add that the hacker hoods that go on the outside, they're not counted. So it's lovely we can get some sun shading there and also get some you know, um, uh, articulation and shadow and a play of you know, shapes and forms, which is which is a lot of fun. And you might comment about how you treated those spaces in the landscape. 
Well, um, down one, so one side boundary, pretty sure it's about one and a half, we had about one and a half metre setback. Yeah, with the pergola and the yeah. Pergola. yeah. So we had, yeah, we had a pergola or an arbor down that uh, side, so we are able to sort of get some climbing species to, to grow up that and, and soften, soften that portion of it, um, as well as, uh, I suppose, down that boundary, it was a bit hard to get any proper um, screening. So we just had some low, um, some sort of some low um, strappy leaf plants and uh, a ficus cumula, which was actually able to grow up the, um, the actual fence. Um, so still able to get some, some green uh, and softening uh, from, from looking out, um, outside, uh, inside out. Uh, and then I believe on the, the northern boundary, um, at the entry, there was, I think that's where it was about 700. Yeah, we went down narrow just next to the stair there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that, um, I believe we just had some, uh, some heliconias that are quite um, very conical and upright. So we're able to sort of get a little bit of planting in there. And then when it, uh, then it was set back to about probably two and a half metres, I believe, past that, which enabled us to actually get um, some actual screening down that whole side boundary for, for probably, probably for about maybe 80% 80, 80 of, of the northern side boundary. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you're, so, um, you're not taking the extremes that are, are allowed so that you actually get a better um, livable, livable result, yeah, and a better design result. Um, and you mentioned the rear boundary before, um, and there was potential for overshadowing. So what um, orientation is that? Um, yeah. It basically faces north, so the backyard faces north. It, with, a, with a higher building um, in front of it? Oh, no. At line. It was really lucky. The um, street out the back is going to be a bit open. Well, it's a little bit of a mixture. I think it was the one you were talking about was to the right on the east, or there's one directly off the rear boundary, oh, but it's on the left hand side. Left hand side, yeah. didn't take yeah. up the whole boundary. It must have been yeah. two or three meters. Yeah. yeah, from the back. So, so you always have to be mindful of what's going to work there, what's going to grow, and how you're going to use that that space. Yeah. Very much a theme in these infill projects is, you know, you get this beautiful kind of concept, but you've got to work it in with those other buildings next door. I know that um, when you see the view when you're going up the stair and you see through and you see the high rises beyond, that view will probably stay because what's being developed now is that's actually a, um, the circulations uh, or, you know, vehicle circulation to a new development where that's where the the cars are coming into their garages, and that's going to be free, you know, for the next, you know, foreseeable 50 or more years, I'm sure. So that's really great. And yeah, there was that bit there with two kind of covered with the tree, which is why we all forget about it. <laughs> Very well done. Um, so, Amy, um, sounds like you're describing the fact that it's not just uh, an enclosure, like once you're inside, you, you don't actually engage with the outside, so you've designed ways of being able to um, place yourself in the neighbourhood. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, and, and Joel probably um, glossed over the ground floor, which has a beautiful sort of terrace. So the, the um, you know, we need to maximise the space in a way. So our, our bedrooms go over and cover a nice sort of shaded terrace area. And then that's actually what presents to a little bit of backyard and then the pool. So there's that beautiful interaction with that. Um, the way the stairways work, they're, they're, they're not all connected. People kind of don't expect that. So you're coming downstairs and you, you forget that there's another stair to go down to the, you know, the lower level, which gives a bit of extra privacy. But that view to, you know, the view on entry and then you kind of go away from that and you go to internal view, but then you come upstairs, like in the video, you turn the corner, you present with this um, east, uh, sorry, um, well, it is kind of east, but um, south view where, where you can kind of then, um, you know, what the south view sort of looks out to the ocean east and then you've got the other side that kind of looks towards surface to the north. And those, you know, it's basically a flute which is a v another very common um, design theme in, in narrowness is you've got the glass both ends and of course, you know, as much height as you can do so you get this kind of beautiful sort of flute space. Right, so even on a, on a narrow lot, you don't feel confined? No, and, and then we added skylights. <laughs> right, so there are... Yeah, we've got a question over here. Wait, 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 I'll bring this... 
So uh, different lot sizes have different setbacks then. So a smaller lot has a less less setback. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's yeah. right. If you're doing with the um, Queensland Development Code and you're playing with that, if you're in a new area where it might be covered by a plan of development, they may have written their own. But if you're, yeah. if you're just a regular old lot in Queensland, anywhere in Queensland, there's a little chart and, you know, it's just an algorithm, I guess, they work out and it has to do with sunlight and privacy and things like that. And if you're narrower, you can do less. And if you're smaller, you can do less. You can actually Google that. You can look it up online, The what we call the QDC, Queensland Development Code, yeah. Very handy tool and predictable, which is nice. Any more questions? Oh, hands are going up. I'll bring, I'll bring the um, mic around here. Uh, just a question about during construction, being such a small site and in a really busy area and with limited setbacks, how did it go with putting everything on site to do your construction? You might know more than that. Um, I, I was just rechecking the dates <laughs> before the chat because I figured somebody would, would ask me. Demolition, um, firstly the client lived in the property for mm, nearly a year I think, um, so got to know it. Then, then demolition happened um, in March 2020, and then construction started June 2020, with the finish of construction, March 2021. I'm struggling to get a project home built in those sort of periods, so the builder was obviously pretty spot on. I wasn't um, needed to in, be involved too much during the building process, just ex except for design exercises where we would, you know, embellish some of the things like the entry door and, um, you know, shelving and, you know, interior stuff. But I think he just managed pretty well. Um, we left him only just enough room for his scaffolding. <laughs> um, and I would guess I think Caroline and Andrew are probably pretty good at making sure the neighbors are warm and fuzzy too, you know, or whatever they have to do with their scaffolding and things like that. But it is always a problem. But may I say that Dean um, of Lifestyle Homes Gold Coast also built the NV Micro Urban Village, which had even less space to build from. So, he was like living the dream. <laughs> he had so much, a meter and a meter and a half. What are you talking about? That's luxury. Fantastic. Another question? Um, I wanted to ask you about the sustainability features in the home. Well, there's no particular sustainability bling in terms of the solar panels or anything, although they're always planned there and they were planned. I don't think they're in. I think the, you know, the conduit is there to put them on. Um, everything that I design is always well insulated and, you know, well shaded <laughs> in terms of the northern, um, you know, in terms of shading for glazing and things like that. And, um, you know, I don't, th I don't think they had water tank or anything like that. So it's just really comes down to the kind of sustainability that I started with um, way last century, which is good solar orientation, good um, ventilation, of course. So I, I use a lot of high light windows, say, say maybe in the bathrooms. You know, you don't want to destroy your privacy, but I might use those sort of awning windows and, and shade them, um, sorry, and put the white glass on them so there's, you know, that they're actually able to be opened functionally and things like that. So just good light, good ventilation, good insulation, good orientation. I think. I might have forgotten something. You might have had a few more things that maybe have come in the landscape. I suppose anything that wasn't, uh, that, that anything that didn't need to be an um, impervious surface, we made it impervious. So through, um, yeah, obviously through gardens, but then uh, the client also didn't want any turf. So then we actually then introduced a uh, good quality artificial turf as well to assist in yeah, impervious surfaces. And there's another one lovely feature, I mean obviously in terms of material reuse and uh, it came up beautifully in the landscape is that some of the um, columns from the original home were, were saved and then they were used for the pool fencing which turned out to be you know just an amazing feature but you know it's not often you can save much from the demolition but we always try, I always try to have one thing and it's you know at least there's that so there's a little bit of that too. Yeah. Amy, one of the comments um, from your narrative on the film that I really, really liked was um, 
not too much, just enough. I felt that that was a, a really nice way of, of summing up a, um, a design attitude. Hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a rigour. Um, it's easy to get carried away. It's really easy. And um, I think as architects, we you know, just have to draw from our clients' brief and expectations and advice and um, you know, kind of not get you know, into our own vortex. <laughs> but um, it's, I, I love dealing with designing with limitation, to be honest with you. I find that the really challenging space. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have some more, any more questions about Coast Side? Anyway, I'll bring this over to you. Can I um, pass it over to you? Beautiful work. Um, just wondering what the final bill was. The final cost. I did. I did not um, get that in my tech. I didn't ask this morning. I think when I put it into the um, architectural awards, I did have one. I cannot. I honestly cannot remember. Um, I don't know if you know, but I, I do remember. I do recall this when when I um, you know, and I kind of think square meter rates and stuff because I deal with other project homes, all sorts of sort of homes, but not not a lot of luxury stuff, I must say. So I'm more in the kind of the you and me stuff, and I, I recall thinking, oh, that's not too bad. So, um, but but this is the other thing too. And when when Andrew did give me that figure, he said, yes, but keep in mind that there were a lot of deals that were, you know, with some of the suppliers and things for promotion. So it probably would be a distorted figure even if I did know it, um, but I just can't, and yeah, can't guess, that wouldn't be right, but yeah, sorry. I'm not even good at ballparks. I just feel like I either know a number or I don't, <laughs> but I, in this case, I can't, I can't remember. No, I wasn't given a budget, no. Uh, just, just, you know, design it practically so it's not too expensive. <laughs> and is there anything new in, in the way of insulation for our coastal areas with um, problems with moisture and so forth? Is there anything you can comment on that? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. And actually, I was because I've been back to the building a couple of times. And when we were doing the video, Caroline was pointing out a couple of places in the, um, and you know, it's worthy to point out to the way that we did the roof terrace. Um, I, I originally had the idea that the stair would go up into that void space in the in the ceiling, and then we'd pop out because I'm always paranoid about uh, water getting into buildings. And, and on the Gold Coast, we are. And, and I was saying this morning at the Varsity Lakes tour how um, everyone loves a roof terrace, but it is, um, they, they don't happen as often as we want them because of this fear of water. So I, I had thought that we might do the roof terrace as um, a deck over the actual roof below. But Dean did end up waterproofing that, but it uses the same gutter as the house. And I think there was, um, on, on where the um, external stair goes up to the terrace, Caroline was pointing out one spot that where there was a little bit of a drip, you know, it was like, you know, no problem, we got it all fixed. And it was so, it was so reassuring to, you know, I think we nailed it. And getting that um, roof terrace and the guttering and everything going, yeah, I'm um, really confident. And But yeah, I'm always nervous when I put anything outdoor space over indoor space. It's always where builders and architects need to worry. But in this case, the builder took the lead and said, no, nah, We'll do it this way with the waterproofing. It sort of saved a little bit of space internally, which you know the client was happy about. So um, that's the way we did it. But we made sure there was plenty of drainage for it. Yeah, external, like no concealed downpipes or anything like that. Great question. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh, and the other material thing is that we for the battening, it's not actually timber. It is um, aluminium. So I know it's not great from an embodied energy point of view, which Alison is going to be taking notes on, but from a coastal and maintenance point of view uh, for that location and keeping it there, you know, hopefully for a long time, it kind of balances out. But yes, yeah, so there's not going to be any rusting because that's, um, you know, aluminium and with the, the correct fastening, so there won't be any sort of rusting with that. And everything else, we've got more or less um, Hardy's products. So, um, you know, timber and, and the linings that are not really going to be subject to that sort of um, deterioration. One more question. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, this is a hypothetical question that if you were to do a project, a similar project on a similar size site post October 2023 when they have the new um, NCC livable accessible requirements that are coming into the code, how do you see that you'd address that? I don't think anything would change. I don't think I would have to change anything. I'm just, I'm just doing the math now. Firstly, I may have forgotten to tell you guys, but there's a lift, right? Did you know there's a lift? Okay, all right. Now, that's not something they use a lot. They put the groceries in it, send it on up. It's a bit of a dumb waiter type thing from that point of view. But with first floor living, um, a lift is kind of important this day and age, particularly if you're going to have a house in an area where there's an expectation for a certain, you know, uh, amount of quality and, and you know livable sense. Um, the stairs are used almost all the time, but the lift is there for those reasons because it is first world living. So if you're inviting somebody over and they can't climb stairs, how are you going to have them come up to your kitchen? All right, so that is there. Um, all the corridors, there was no, you know, even though it is a narrow house, there was no reason to be skimpy on the corridor. So I think, you know, they're not much over a meter, but they're probably spot on a meter. So we've got that. We've also got level entry because, of course, you're coming into the garage. So even though there are steps up to the main livings, which is where we want guests to be greeted, of course, you go in either to the guest quarters downstairs or through the garage, you're at level entry. Um, am I forgetting? There would be a couple of other things. And, I, I, Bathroom. and toilet, yeah, toilet downstairs, all of that. So width of toilet. You know, to be honest with you, it's a really good point, Alison, because what I'd like to say is, most buildings are not going to have to change that much, and um, particularly if they've been reasonably well designed, right? There might be a few of us that are caught out in sloping lots and stuff like that. I mean, let's face it, it was a flat lot, so that was a gift. Um, but it's not too hard, and I think with the sustainability as well, I don't, I, I'm sure that would be um, meeting that as well. So, yeah, okay, I don't think, I don't think we'd have to make much change. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Amy. And um, yeah, it sounds like a, a building that um, more people need to study, really, in terms of um, what to do right and, and where to go in the future. Joel, I just want to ask you a question um, to literally to wrap up. From this narrow lot project, um, was there anything new that you learned from that that you're going to be taking into future projects? Well, I suppose in short, probably no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, when I spent six years in council um, assessing uh, landscape plans for, for development applications, and obviously with the Gold Coast and the state it's in, it's all infill. So, um, yeah, for years I worked with developers uh, and builders to uh, essentially design the site layout of, of anything from single dwellings to to high rises to uh, maximise uh, garden area for landscaping, not just in the side boundaries, but a frontage setback as well. So um, I guess for this one, I had just used uh, all my knowledge and background and experience that I've, that I've gained over the years and applied it to, to this job. Yeah, excellent. So um, yeah, it was something that the client could take advantage of, that deep um, understanding, yeah, and avoid the uh, relaxation question yes. as well. Yeah. I must mention too the, <clears throat> the rooftop. I, th I thought Amy did amazing with that because uh, a lot of architects, um, I suppose, can't, or have, well, from what I've seen, have, have struggled to grasp the integration of a rooftop without having to go through council. So I found myself when I was in there, um, it ended up resulting in a lot of podium planters, which then comes back to they fail over time. So um, yeah, so yeah, I think you did a great job. Great comment. On that rooftop. Thanks, yeah. Joel. And um, just to finish up, um, Amy, you did mention that um, the house was nominated for uh, a local award. Lo yeah. Yes, that's right. We received a commendation in the Australian Institute of Architects, um, Gold Coast, Re Gold Coast Northern Rivers Region Award, which was really lovely because I'll tell you what, the competition was tough. There was a lot of beautiful um, work in that. So we were really pleased um, to be rewarded with that um, yeah, acknowledgement. 
Congratulations, and, and uh, to you. the whole team. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Amy and Joel this afternoon, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Gold Coast Open House. <laughs> Don't forget to take one of our fabulous tote bags with you. Thanks to, uh, before everyone leaves, thank you to Artwork for this fantastic space as well. We're yeah, very privileged. <laughs>